And so what Roberts is saying, and we'll see this from the text, what Roberts is saying is, you guys are full of shit, majority opinion. You're pretending like there's only one order involved that just ordered a group of people to leave a certain area. Today, we're talking about a US Supreme Court case that famously ruled that Japanese internment during World War II was compatible with the US Constitution. The name of this case is Korematsu v. United States. The basic facts of the case, at least on the surface, appear very simple. There was a citizen, a US citizen, he was Japanese in the sense that he had Japanese ancestry, but he was a full-fledged US citizen. His name was Korematsu. He lived in Northern California. And uh, during World War II, he remained in his home. He didn't leave his home, didn't leave a certain area that he was ordered to leave by a certain order called Relocation Order Number 34. He was then arrested and charged for violating Relocation Order Number 34. And the question is whether this order was constitutional or whether because it targeted Japanese Americans based on their ancestry, it was unconstitutional. But actually, Japanese internment is more complicated than that. There wasn't one order. It wasn't Relocation Order Number 34. And it wasn't some other order. There wasn't one law, one statute, one executive order that constituted Japanese internment. It was actually a combination of different orders that worked together in certain ways to force Japanese Americans into concentration camps or similar types of prisons. What we read for today were three things. We read the majority opinion written by Justice Black, and then we read two different dissenting opinions written by Justice Roberts and another one by Justice Murphy. Now, any time we read a Supreme Court case where there are multiple dissents, in this case there was actually, I think, a third dissent, uh, but we didn't read that for this course. Any time you see multiple dissents, you have to ask yourself why. Why was it that, for example, these two justices couldn't agree on the same series of criticisms of the majority opinion such that they could sign on to the same dissent. There must be some interesting, potentially very important difference between the dissents that we get from Roberts and Murphy. And so that's something to look for. We'll sort of return to that at the end. Another thing that we're gonna to return to at the end, after talking more about sort of the details of the case and the details of the opinions, is we're gonna to return to why we're reading this case at all. This lecture is part of a larger philosophy of law course. And in this course, at the moment, we're reading a foundational text in philosophy of law called The Concept of Law by H.L.A. Hart. But in between reading chapters of that book, we're reading fundamental or landmark U.S. Supreme Court cases. And the question is why? Why this one? Why now? What about chapter three of H.L.A. Hart's book does this case explain or exemplify or demonstrate. Anyway, I'll say a little bit something about that at the end. Let's start by saying something about the majority opinion that was written by Justice Black. So the majority opinion of the US Supreme Court found that Japanese internment, specifically as exemplified by relocation order number 34, was compatible with the Constitution. It wasn't unconstitutional. That's what the majority found. The main sort of interpretive constitutional issue going on here is this. There are two sort of principles of legal interpretation. One principle of legal interpretation is that when a group of people is singled out by the law in any way because of their race, the court should apply what's called strict scrutiny. That is, the court should absolutely make sure that the law was as specific and tailored as it needed to be. It didn't overreach at all in achieving the legitimate aim that it was trying to achieve. If it oversteps its bounds at all, then reading that law with strict scrutiny will find that it was unconstitutional um, and the law would be overturned. But then there's this other interpretive constitutional principle involved, 
which is something like when you're dealing with executive orders or laws passed during wartime, the courts should not apply strict scrutiny because war is a crazy thing and there's a, a significant amount of discretion that needs to be given to generals if they are going to be able to effectively wage war. So this is the tension. It's the tension between these two interpretive principles that the majority opinion was sort of dealing with and they, they decided that the interests of preventing espionage and sabotage and that sort of thing outweighed the rights of Japanese Americans during World War II. They did not apply strict scrutiny in this case. The majority opinion does several sort of weird, interesting things when you get into the details. And uh, if you're enrolled in this course proper, then we can talk about some of those things and we're going to talk about some of those things on the discussion boards and in other parts of the course. But I wanna move on, if I can, to the first dissenting opinion, the one by Justice Roberts. Roberts' main point is that the majority opinion is engaging in a kind of self-delusion or self-deception when they're only considering relocation order number 34. Relocation order 34 said that Japanese Americans had to leave a certain area, but it was applied in combination with other orders that require Japanese Americans not to leave that area. And so what ends up happening is that these people, simply because of their race, were required by this confluence of orders to just voluntarily report to prison. That's what they were ordered to do. And that only happened as a result not of relocation number 34, but of, I think it was called Proclamation 4 or something like that, some other, a whole bunch of other uh, orders that were given to Japanese Americans. And so what Roberts is saying, and we'll see this from the text, what Roberts is saying is, you guys are full of shit, majority opinion. You're pretending like there's only one order involved that just ordered a group of people to leave a certain area. Maybe that would be constitutional. Maybe not, but maybe it would, if that was the only thing that was going on in this case. But that's not the only thing that's going on in this case. And the majority opinion, in order to justify this practice, is sort of pretending that that's the only thing going on. Because if they acknowledged really and truly that there was this combination of orders that was being imposed on Japanese Americans, if they acknowledge that, Robert says, well, then obviously they would find that this practice, Japanese internment, is unconstitutional. Here is what Roberts says. Before we talk about this passage from Justice Roberts, from the first dissent that we read for today, while I was writing that passage up, I realized that I made a mistake. This order wasn't called relocation order number 34. It was called exclusion order number 34. Sorry, got to get the details right. Exclusion order number 34 was the one that said that Korematsu and other Japanese Americans living in a certain area in California had to leave that area or report to a relocation center. Proclamation number four, the one that the majority opinion wants to ignore, is the one that said they can't leave that area. Here's what Robert says. The facts show that the exclusion was but a part of an overall plan for forcible detention. This exclusion order was just one of the orders that were involved in a coordinated effort. The two conflicting orders, one which commanded him, Korematsu, to stay, that's this one, and the other which commanded him to go, that's this one, were nothing but a cleverly devised trap to accomplish the real purpose of the military authority, which was to lock him up in a concentration camp. The only course by which the petitioner could avoid arrest and prosecution was to go to that camp according to the instructions to be given him. So this wasn't an exclusion order that said that Japanese Americans couldn't be in a certain area. This was an arrest order that was given to Japanese Americans purely based on their race. And Roberts thinks that's a big difference. It's a big difference to exclude people from an area because of their race and to uh, imprison them because of their race. Now you might think both of those are bad. Maybe they're not equally bad, but 
both of them are sufficiently bad, in which case you'll be interested in what Justice Murphy has to say. Anyway, Roberts continues, we know that this is the fact. Why should we set up a figmentary and artificial situation instead of addressing ourselves to the actualities of the case? Roberts is asking, why is the majority opinion, why are the majority justices, the justices that signed on to the majority opinion, why are they pretending like there was only one order involved, an exclusion order? Why aren't they talking about the real case as it really was, which involved a combination of multiple orders that had the result of imprisoning Japanese Americans? This is a rhetorical question that Roberts asks in his dissent, and the straightforward answer that is suggested is, well, we shouldn't. We shouldn't set up a figmentary artificial situation instead of addressing ourselves to the actualities of the case. But there's also another answer that is suggested by Roberts asking this question. The question, why should we set up this artificial situation? Why should we pretend that there was only one order? And that suggested answer is, well, the majority justices, they pretend that there's only one order because that's the only way they can stomach giving this result, handing down this ruling that they would, that they know is unjust, at least on some level, and that they know is incorrect. And they wouldn't be able to convince themselves to do it if they were to really confront the actualities of the case, which is that there was this other order, this proclamation order that prevented them from leaving the area. And so they were thereby forced to just go to these relocation centers and ultimately go to prisons or concentration camps. Now let's talk about the dissent of Justice Murphy. Murphy doesn't sign on to Roberts's opinion really for the following reason. Roberts says, look, the majority opinion is ignoring the facts. They're pretending like there's only one order that targeted Japanese Americans, just an order that told them to leave an area. But there's really two orders. But that criticism suggests that, well, if there were really only one order, then maybe the majority opinion would be right. Justice Murphy thinks, no. Even if there was just one order that we were talking about, in order to leave a certain area, even if Japanese Americans weren't being imprisoned based on their race or their ancestry or whatever, it would still be wrong, it would still be unconstitutional. And that's the sort of thing that Murphy wants to emphasize. Murphy basically wants to say, look, this exclusion order, even all by itself, was just too racist to be constitutional. Here's what Murphy says. The exclusion, either temporarily or permanently, of all persons with Japanese blood in their veins has no reasonable relation to the removal of the dangers of invasion, sabotage, and espionage. Notice one thing that Murphy's doing here. He's pointing out that even if we don't apply strict scrutiny, even if we're only looking for just some reasonable connection between the deserving or legitimate aims of the military authority, of the military leaders, that is, it's a legitimate aim to want to prevent sabotage or espionage or invasion of North America by the Japanese during World War II. That's a legitimate aim, fine. Even if all we want, all we need in order to uphold these laws and find them to be compatible with the Constitution, if all we want is for there to be some reasonable connection, something whatsoever, between the orders as they were given and the aim that they attempted to achieve, even if we were looking for just some connection, any barely reasonable connection, we wouldn't find it. Why is there no reasonable connection at all? Why should these laws be struck down even if we don't apply strict scrutiny? Murphy says, that relation is lacking, because that, that is that rational relation between the order given and the purpose or the aim of the order. That relation is lacking because the exclusion order necessarily must rely for its reasonableness. So it doesn't have this reasonableness. It needs to rely on this to have reasonableness and, it, and, and it's unreasonable. Anyway, it must rely for its reasonableness on the assumption that all persons of Japanese ancestry may, be a, may have a dangerous tendency to commit sabotage and espionage. That is, that's such an unreasonable claim that merely having Japanese ancestry makes you, gives you this tendency, this dangerous tendency to commit sabotage or espionage against the United States, right? 
that unreasonable assumption is the only way that a connection can be made between the order that was given and the purpose of the order. And because that assumption is so unreasonable, there is no rational or reasonable connection. And so even if we don't apply strict scrutiny, uh, we should find that this law is unconstitutional. That this forced exclusion was the result, in good measure, of this erroneous assumption of racial guilt rather than bona fide military necessity is evidenced by, and then Murphy goes on to give a whole bunch of examples of super racist stuff that leaders of the US military said. Things about the Japanese being uh, members of a, what was it? They're members of a subversive race, the enemy race. These are the ways in which the US military leaders were talking, and so, and that's the evidence that they were relying on this assumption of racial guilt. And because that assumption of racial guilt is inaccurate, there is no reasonable connection between the order given and the purpose of that order. And so Murphy thinks even if there was only one order involved, well, then that one order would be unconstitutional. Okay, so we now sort of see, I think, rather straightforwardly, why Roberts and Murphy wrote separate dissenting opinions. I won't repeat all of that. The one thing I want to mention before we wrap up our discussion of Korematsu, this court case, is why we read this after reading chapter three of the concept of law. Mostly I pick these court cases because they're interesting and important and they're fruitful cases for lots of discussion and they're sort of foundational landmark cases and that you should know them if you're gonna know the history of the United States legal system a little bit. Um, but one connection is that in that chapter, in chapter three of the concept of law, Hart made a big deal about the difference between duty imposing and power conferring rules. Hart's point was that Austin's theory, which Hart is attacking in chapters three and four of the concept of law, Austin's theory can only hand, handle duty imposing rules or laws. It can't handle, it can't explain power conferring ones which are a central part of a legal system. It might look like this case is about a bunch of ordinary duty imposing laws. Like, you know, laws that tell you what to do or what not to do, what you must do or must not do. That's duty imposing laws. And these orders, all of them, these are duty imposing. They tell ordinary citizens what they ought or ought not do, what they must or must not do. Well, that's what this case might appear to be about. But actually, once you realize that there are conflicting interpretive principles, and once you realize that this is a case in many ways just as much about the decision-making process of the military authority and the authority or the power that that military, that those military leaders had at the time, you realize this case is just as much about power conferring rules, rules that give authority or power to certain people, like the power to military leaders to issue orders. That's a power conferring feature of the US legal system, not a duty imposing feature. I mean, and then there is this thing about these principles of interpretation. It's gonna turn out that these kinds of principles, like you ought to apply strict scrutiny or not, um, maybe or maybe not, turn out to be a problem for HLA Hart. Uh, there is a famous well-known criticism that we're gonna discuss in this course uh, by Ronald Dworkin, where he claims that certain kinds of legal standards that he calls principles uh, can't be captured on Hart's own view. But we haven't even gotten to Hart's own view, that's a whole other thing, we'll get onto that later. Anyway, that's it. <laughs>